Hello, everybody. Welcome to the fifth episode of HLB's International Tax Webinar, this time keeping up with the latest indirect taxation issues. I'm very happy to welcome our speakers, which are Alexander Schallock from Germany, speaking about indirect taxes. He is a tax advisor which is, with a high experience on indirect taxes. Same is for Lloyd Newton from Canada. The company, HLB company, is Swartz Levitsky Feldman. Instead of Robert Facer, who unfortunately got sick, um, Sean Turner is here from Menzies, telling us about um, a UK insight on indirect taxes. And last but not least, Stacey Roberts from 8 Bailey, the US, will tell us about the recent developments on US topics. I'm, I'm Lutz Meyer, the Global Indirect Tax Service Leader of HLB International, trying to coordinate the VAT services on an international level. Now kicking off to the first topic, which um, in this time is, of course, Brexit. Even if um, almost everybody of us is a bit exhausted talking about this, um, Sean, maybe you can give us the latest insight on that. Okay, thanks, Lutz. Uh, yeah, um, what are the VAT and customs duty implications of Brexit? Very good question. Um, we don't know yet. This is changing now daily, hourly even. Um, it's, it's very interesting to try and keep up with it all. Um, but where are we now? Well, we were given the 29th of March as a, um, a first date, but that has now disappeared with um, Theresa May's um, her, her deal being voted out by the, by the UK government. Um, we now, I think, move on to a date more relevant, which is going to be the 12th of April. Um, I believe, if you read the papers again, that uh, all the MPs have been voting over the last few days. And the, the papers tell us today, the headlines say that the MPs have voted to take control of the, uh, the Brexit timetable. So effectively, the Prime Minister has been defeated again. She was trying to gauge um, the, the feel within her cabinet. Um, so we are now going through a process of what they're calling indicative votes on various things such as maybe a softer Brexit, the customs union, and even a second referendum. Um, I think we've got to about the 12th of April, I think it is the 12th of April, to come up with an alternative deal. Um, this could lead into a, uh, a longer extension to the Brexit process, but until that deal was on the table, um, we just don't know. So where are we now? Very difficult to say. Um, the scenario one there, confirming a deal with the EU, Again, um, until that deal was on the table, we just don't know. Uh, we don't know where we're going to be with the customs union, how long the transitional period, if any, will be, uh, what the status of the Northern Ireland border will be, because that's causing um, a, a bit of a problem with the original deal, um, how well we fit with the uh, free trade agreements, and then the whole import and export process itself, which I think will be for indirect taxes, one of the major, major issues. So will we confirm a deal? We don't yet know. What that deal look like? We don't yet know. Um, so I think with scenario one, there isn't really huge amounts to say. So whether Alexander now has got anything to add on, on his side from that. Yeah, thanks, John. Yeah, from the EU perspective, um, uh, the authorities here in the EU has uh, already prepared um, in much cases um, for this scenario. Um, finally, if the deal takes place, then um, there's no so much change um, from EU perspective. That means that deliveries from EU countries to the UK can still be handled as zero rated uh, and in case uh, transport are uh, performed from the UK to EU countries, uh, no import um, VT will occur and um, VAT registration can be avoided for UK uh, Okay, so there's a bit, a bit more clarity from that side. In the current situation. Okay. I think with scenario two, the no deal scenario, there's a bit more in terms of what HMRC here in the UK have been saying. They've published quite a lot, um, have been sending letters out to all that registered traders that deal in goods with other EU member states. And they've been putting in um, a series of simplifications and transitional measures to assist with the, the flow of goods in the event of a no deal Brexit. Um, they've advised UK business, businesses to make sure they have their economic operator registration and identification number, the URI, because you're going to need those to file import and export declarations. Um, they've put in an additional measure called transitional simplified procedures, which is due to last 12 months, um, which will facilitate the uh, import of goods through certain ports into the UK via simplified frontier declaration 
and then payment of duty and import VAT at a deferred later date. They've talked about postponed import accounting, which I think the, the Dutch may use already, um, whereby you don't pay and defer import VAT, you actually enter it into your VAT return as a reverse charge mechanism. Um, they've also put in measures or will put in measures to simplify um, the trade tariff for about 87% of goods arriving in the UK. So the UK tax authorities are trying to prioritise flow of goods over compliance. So we are seeing a lot of measures coming into, into place. They've also mentioned the cross-border refund mechanism and how that may uh, be impacted and also the uh, union MOS registration scheme for um, digitally supplied services. So there's a lot going on. If we get a no deal, measures may well be in place uh, and there's a lot of uh, communication with business, which is only a good thing. Yeah, from a EU perspective, um, there are also some challenges in case of a no deal scenario. Uh, many aspects need to be considered. Um, for instance, if we have um, transport deliveries from the EU countries to the UK, then um, the transaction can be handled zero rated still, but uh, the documentation requirements will change, um, and uh, this has a huge impact um, on the side of companies who are exporting goods to the UK. As well, in case um, UK companies will um, transport goods from the UK to EU jurisdictions, then the import VAT will occur, and it has an um, um, enormous impact on cash flow situation for many companies. Uh, and for that reason, uh, we recommend our customers in the EU um, to prepare on a no deal scenario already, and um, especially uh, to consider the no deal in uh, any contracts agreed with customers in the UK to consider, um, for instance, incoterm situations and to decide who has to bear the costs for custom duties and import VAT. Yeah, and there's, there's no doubt in a no-deal scenario that um, cost implication is, is one thing in terms of cash flow, payment of duty, VAT, but also the administration cost of having perhaps to do customs declarations for the first time, um, more staff, maybe outsourcing to a freight forwarder. So um, there's, there's a lot of things, bank guarantees as well, that a business needs to think about um, in the event of a, a no-deal and best to do it now, really. Yeah, so okay. you... Yeah, go on. Sorry. You can start with. Um, Sean, I, I would like to, to hear um, if uh, can, there comes a client of you today or tomorrow in your office or give, gives you a phone call um, to, and asks you, what shall I do in terms of Brexit? Um, is, there, is there a minimum advice you can give your clients in order to be in some kind prepared? The, the minimum advice for a no deal is to get yourself an economic operator registration number um, so you're prepared for import and export declarations. Think about payment of duty and VAT, cash flow, bank guarantees. Register for transitional simplified procedures if you're a UK established business. All you can really do is put those preparation measures in place and then, and then wait really. There's, there's not a lot else. Uh, systems as well. Um, speak to freight forwarders. Software where you need to, uh, additional software for import export declaration or will you outsource the whole lot. There's a whole raft of things you can do to prepare, but obviously until we know what's going to happen, um, you can only do that preparation and perhaps just prepare for the worst as opposed to, to doing nothing. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, just to let everybody know, there is a chat function. If you have uh, a question or would like to ask the presenter something uh, about the topics I mentioned during the webinar, just type in and um, we'll then pick up accordingly. Um, yes, thanks for giving an insight about Brexit, which is indeed um, a very uh, interesting topic at the moment because nobody can do uh, indirect taxes without keeping an eye on that uh, due to the fact that the UK is a very important economy in the EU. So um, we are still struggling also with clients um, who have business, um, let's say, in Germany or on the continent in the UK asking us, uh, what can we do? And the simple answer is, uh, like Sean said, well, uh, please try to be uh, aware of any changes and try to react on time if something gets decided somewhere. Okay. Um, in terms of the next topic, it's online selling of goods and services. I would like to hand over to Alexander because we have a lot of developments in this area because it's a strong growing branch and market. Um, everybody knows that 
all the online sellers or marketplaces like Amazon, eBay, Alibaba, etc., do strong market developments in the past and currently. So um, who is well as active on that area needs to be um, on time and have to have a current insight on that. So I would like to ask Alexander um, about the changes taking place in Germany in that term. Yeah, thanks, Lutz. Um, yeah, in the EU, and especially in Germany, um, in addition to the Brexit scenario, uh, we often have the bad issue nowadays about marketplaces and distant seller to private individuals within the EU. Uh, just for the background, um, in case um, um, a retailer is selling goods to a private individual, uh, then uh, the VT um, of the country of destination um, is applicable. That means uh, that, for instance, a German company who will sell goods to other EU countries um, will have to register uh, for VET in these countries and, and the other way around. And um, there was a test and a um, huge markup for uh, the tax authorities that they realized that um, many um, companies are not registered for VET in, VT in uh, the country of destination. Uh, and the EU has decided to um, handle it differently from the current perspective. Um, the EU wants to have the marketplaces also in the liability for the VT that is not yet paid to the tax authorities. And the German government has already created facts in, on that case and has started um, to amend the VET Act already for the year 2019, and many uh, EU countries will follow uh, this year. Uh, and um, yeah, what is the background? Um, yeah, in case um, um, a reseller is not um, sell, um, VET reset for VT here in Germany, is not paying any VT. Then um, the authority passes um, the liability for the VT um, back to the marketplace, to Amazon and uh, all the others uh, that they have to pay the VT um, to the authority. Uh, and uh, so it's on the interest um, of the marketplaces now to um, check that their sellers are registered for VT and uh, to ask them um, showing a certificate that they are actually registered. If they are not registered, uh, then um, the marketplace um, will cancel the account and the um, seller cannot um, um, form any supplies via that Amazon account in, in Germany any longer. Um, the problem is uh, that um, the VET Act is here in Germany implemented just a couple of weeks ago and um, especially for non-EU countries it's already applicable uh, and um, non-EU entrepreneurs need to show a certificate that they are registered for VET uh, and that has led to a lot of uh, problems for these non-EU um, sellers um, because uh, the authority in Germany needs some more time to file any certificates. Uh, therefore, the deadline for showing the certificate is um, um, extended to the 15th of April 2019. Uh, but I think it's still challenging for many of these entrepreneurs and um, Amazon has already started to cancel um, accounts uh, for companies who are not uh, registered in Germany yet. Um, uh, in Germany, unfortunately, um, uh, the process uh, for issuing the certificate is not um, possible on online um, way of um, application, but you have to file it um, on a paperwork um, and that needs more time than expected. Especially Chinese companies um, has nowadays a problem um, to have um, the certificate um, on the due date. And um, but. Um, uh, for the tax authority side, uh, it has a huge impact. Um, we have uh, been informed that within the um, last couple of weeks, um, about 18,000 um, uh, Chinese companies had registered for VT for the first time in, in Germany. So um, this um, um, amendment of the VAT Act has a huge impact, um, and the authority thinks that they can handle it and uh, received an enormous increase of VT income. And for EU countries, um, this will be similar uh, from October 2019. So, uh, recommend all um, EU entrepreneurs who are active um, to um, private individuals in Germany on the supply chain um, to register uh, in Germany. And if they are registered, to ask for the certificate so that they are able to show it to their marketplace um, so that they can avoid any penalties and um, especially they can avoid that Amazon and the other marketplaces uh, will cancel uh, their account. So it um, has an enormous impact um, and um, um, as we understood, um, all the other EU countries will follow uh, a similar way uh, and, um, and we will see by the end of this year, I think, um, whether this is actually um, some kind of improvement for the authority or whether 
this is um, much more um, administration uh, cost issue for the companies uh, acting here in Germany or in uh, other EU countries. But for so far, uh, many EU countries um, are the first who have some impression on that um, um, flow of work. Yeah, thank so you, Alexander. Can... And um, yeah. just just yeah. to, to, to add that yeah. by the chat. Yeah, just to add that that's not only a theoretical threat uh, closing the account because I currently have a, cl a client who comes from Spain who has some unpaid uh, taxes with authorities, and he also has applied for that certificate. And the authorities mentioned, well, um, we can um, issue that, but please be aware that we will inform the marketplace operator about that. Um, leading to the consequence that the marketplace operator will close the sales account. Okay, thanks, um, Alexander. Much appreciated. Sean, maybe you can give us an insight on the UK part of that. Yes, uh, it's very similar to um, how Alexander just, just described there. We've seen a um, HMRC specific team set up, the online selling compliance team, um, and we've had many clients now where they are coming to the online selling place to get the, the records, all the sales transactional data, and they are auditing all of that against the VAT returns. Um, and if they're not happy that they don't reconcile, they'll be charging penalties and interest. Uh, plus also, as Alexander also said, the, um, the threat of closing their online selling place, their, their online account. And they will go to Amazon or whoever and say, please close the account until, until further notice. And we've seen that done. So they have got quite a bit of power and they, and they are using it. Um, aside from that, there was the Fulfillment House Registration Scheme, um, which came in last year. And this is a compulsory scheme where your Fulfillment House has to register with HMRC and report various information to HMRC on the overseas businesses trading through it and storing goods in the UK. Um, they have to do due diligence and risk assessment of, uh, of their customers and again provide all this information to HMRC. Um, we've seen the extension of joint and several liability as well for online marketplaces. So if they're aware of any overseas businesses or UK businesses for that matter, who either should be registered or not declaring the right amount of VAT, then the fulfillment house or online marketplace has joint and several liability. So that's kind of encouraging them to, to obviously report and do the right due diligence and checks on their customers and also make HMRC aware. Um, HMRC will publish a list of all the uh, compliant fulfillment house uh, businesses, which uh, I guess you'd want to be on rather than, than the non-compliant list. So HMRC are taking this very seriously. Um, the final point there is about split payment method, where merchants and third parties who see the detailed transactional data, um, they're being asked perhaps going forward to split the payment and pay the VAT over. Um, this is currently going through consultation um, the results of which were, were out at the end of last year, and there's now an industry working group um, taking this forward with potential for pilots, um, what are the short and medium term measures that could be introduced, how this be implemented, and how are HMRC going to enforce the rules. So we're seeing lots in the online marketplace at the moment, lots of control and lots of, uh, sort of use of technology by HMRC, which I think is only going to get more and more um, as, as time goes on. Okay, so tax authorities um, all um, all over Europe um, are aware about, about all these unregistered taxpayers, and it seems, Stacy, that um, on the Wayfair case, more or less the same happened in the US. Um, also now, which is very interesting for companies from overseas. That's correct. That's correct. Um, so with Wayfair, um, for those of you who are not familiar with the case. Uh, that case came down through the US Supreme Court last June and all the states have, I mean, 35 plus states have responded in some way, shape or form. And so we've got inbound companies that are absolutely having to grapple with these rules uh, because of the fact that a lot of states have gone to, um, to economic nexus rules in the wake of Wayfair such that the general rule uh, from that case was that if an online seller or remote seller uh, made $100,000 of sales into a jurisdiction or 200 transactions, 
into that jurisdiction, then that was enough of a presence in the jurisdiction in order to have nexus and a filing and collection responsibility. So what that does is basically adds a layer to the way the states have determined nexus for sales and use tax purposes in, in, historically. Uh, in the past, it had been all based on physical presence. So if a uh, taxpayer had people or inventory or anything like that in a jurisdiction, then uh, the, the taxpayer had nexus and therefore had a sales tax collection and filing responsibility. Well, now we have to layer in the economic nexus rules. Physical presence still is a, a test and a standard. However, uh, we have to layer in now these economic nexus rules and the states um, have kind of gone into different categories, which I have on the slide here, where we have the $100,000 or 200 transactions, which was what the ruling in Wayfair stood for. And then we've got a few states that have passed different thresholds, meaning they have different dollar thresholds and maybe the number of transaction tests must be met. So it's a little bit uh, stricter test. Uh, then there's other states out there that have just kind of decided and passed their own rules. Uh, they have what we call unique rules and that maybe it's the nexus is uh, determined based on an in-state referrer, meaning that if you had a um, somebody who was working on your behalf that referred um, work, or, uh, customers to you, um, then that referrer uh, could create nexus for the taxpayer in a state based upon that activity. And then we've got a few states that are holding out um, and they're called notice and reporting states. And those states, uh, we're seeing kind of a shift away from those. Uh, we've seen more and more states in the wake of Wayfair pass economic nexus rules, which are uh, all on the sales tax side. However, the notice and reporting is on the use tax side. So, um, you know, here in the US, we've got the sales tax and it's complemented typically with the use with the use tax. And so what that means for notice and reporting uh, for taxpayers that are remote sellers do not have nexus into a notice and reporting state, then they have a duty to notify, that's the notice piece, their customers that they are not collecting tax and that the customer may have a uh, use tax responsibility. And then the reporting piece of it is that then they have to send a report to the state department of revenue listing out the customers and the purchases that those customers made. So it's basically a roadmap for that for that uh, State Department of Revenue to expect use tax from uh, customers in their state. Um, and like I said, I mean, there are so there are a few states that are holding out with that with those rules, but we're seeing uh, more and more states move to the uh, economic nexus thresholds, fortunately, because the notice and reporting is a little bit of an administrative burden. Um, so what does this really mean? Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, we've got we've got taxpayers that are you know coming inbound. We've got taxpayers that are already here in the U.S. that are grappling with these rules. And basically, what the state's expectation is is that if if a taxpayer meets and exceeds these thresholds that each state has, and as I mentioned, we've got 35 plus that have pass some kind of legislation, um, most of which fall into the $100,000 or 200 transaction rule. But again, there are some different flavors of that. Um, but the expectation of the states is once taxpayers exceed those thresholds, then they must register and get a sales and sales and use tax permit. And then they would start collecting from customers in those states and then remit and file uh, the sales tax to those states. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that Wayfair and the rules around Wayfair are all related to Nexus. So you could have a situation where um, you're selling something that is um, exempt uh, for whatever reason. Maybe it's a sale for resale. Maybe it's a manufacturing item, item et cetera. Those types of taxability uh, decisions, they still exist. So uh, what we advise clients is, okay, let's let's look and see what your thresholds, or if you've met thresholds, meaning let's look at your sales data by state, usually on a rolling 12-month period. And then if you've uh, exceeded some thresholds, and look, let's look and see if your items are taxable, uh, because then uh, that population of states in which, you know, they may need to do something sooner than later uh, actually may uh, go down. 
So um, that's kind of a short and sweet summary on uh, where we are with Wayfair right now. Thank you, Stacy. Thanks a lot. Um, I have two questions on that. Uh, maybe you can give uh, an idea about this. Um, first question is, is there a central source, information source where I can have uh, a check about the thresholds in the various states is the first question. And the second question is, um, don't um, think about that, about my clients, but what if a client does not know or willingly ignore uh, the uh, registration duty to pay over uh, the tax to the um, federal states? And so um, for at least for a resource, um, we at I Bailey, we have a very good resource on our website. So if anybody's wondering or wanting to pull a chart, we have one on our website uh, through our state and local tax uh, page that will give everybody the uh, state by state threshold and the effective dates because uh, as everybody may be aware, the effective dates um, have really been all over the place with respect to what states have, uh, you know, how they've reacted and when they wanted to start enforcing it. We had some states that came on board October 1st of last year, the case was decided June 21st of last year. And so then, and then we've had other states that have been slow to respond. Um, surprisingly, we've got California that finally responded and their enforcement date is April 1st of this year. So, uh, there's a good chart out there, so I recommend everybody, uh, I'll point everybody to our website, uh, iBailey.com, and then um, navigate to our state and local tax page because uh, we have a good chart there if anybody's wondering what those thresholds are by state. And then um, what happens if a taxpayer is not compliant? Um, you know, th that's a really good question because this is a little bit of uncharted territory. Um, when you're a pure remote seller, it's a little bit more difficult for uh, for the states to uh, find uh, taxpayers. Or um, what we have, what we do tend to see is a uh, maybe a vendor of a taxpayer or a customer of a taxpayer getting audited by a state, and then that flags uh, one of our taxpayers, and therefore they may be. Uh, they may be discovered that way. Uh, we just have a lot of clients that have been proactive with this, which is fortunate for us uh, because what happens is if they do not collect the tax and they are discovered uh, later, then that tax becomes their liability. And so um, there are ways to mitigate it proactively if we have situations like that. However, if a state were to discover a taxpayer who has, has not been compliant, then that sales tax liability is the responsibility of, of our taxpayers, of our clients, unfortunately. Okay, thanks a lot. Very interesting. And um, I think there are a lot of clients who have a to-do on the list now. Um, Lloyd, maybe you can help us out in terms of the recent development uh, in Canada uh, on online selling of goods and services. Thanks, Lutz. The, uh, the Canadian um, taxpayers have been, uh, been uh, watching carefully what's been going on in other countries, and unfortunately we haven't been leaders in this area. We've been more followers than leaders. Uh, the VAT in Canada is called the Goods and Services Tax, GST. And some provinces have merged their own provincial sales taxes in with the federal goods and services tax. And that's what we call the HST, which is the most uh, common name that I think uh, people outside Canada recognize. Now, Quebec has its own goods and services tax, which is called the QST. What the Quebec government did is it was very proactive and it recognized that there's a huge revenue stream in this area, and uh, it it went after companies like Target. It targeted Netflix, and um, because they were selling into Quebec to users, so there was a real leakage in the system. Because of, of, we all know that in a VAT system, the users are, are the ones who are really the the final payers of the tax. So they changed their legislation in 2019 to catch these large companies like Netflix and, and others. And they were very successful in getting all these companies to register for the Quebec sales tax, the QST. So all these companies that now are registering are collecting the tax. 
So you've, you've now kind of leveled the playing field because previously the individuals didn't pay the tax to, uh, that, was, that was on the Netflix services. So the local suppliers who were providing competing services, uh, of course, were at a competitive disadvantage. And this way, the, the playing field was leveled and the Quebec government was successful in collecting a lot more uh, revenue. Um, so what is likely to happen in Canada is we're going to see the federal government probably follow suit. Uh, they'll probably take a little while to watch what happens in Quebec and how difficult this is for Quebec to, uh, to implement. But so far, it seems to be going very well in Quebec. So I think the, the federal government will probably uh, recognize the, the loss of this revenue and, and also try to level the playing field so that local suppliers aren't put at a disadvantage. So, so what you have here is the pressure uh, on the Canadian and the Canadian federal government will probably be also imposed by the individual provinces who have chosen to harmonize their sales taxes provincially with, with the federal government because they recognize that there's a revenue loss to them as well. So the federal government can't really operate in a vacuum here. And to complicate things further, we do have some provinces uh, who uh, did not harmonize, meaning that they still have uh, a system similar to the United States where they have their own, what we call provincial sales tax. And whether these uh, provinces choose to implement their own type of tax on these, uh, on the online selling of goods and services, it would just be a matter of time. And I think once they see the amount of revenue that Quebec is collecting, I, I, I just can't see them foregoing that stream. So um, uh, I think what, what, what we're gonna see in the future is Canada taking a more proactive view on this and imposing uh, taxes uh, across the board, being at the federal level and at the provincial levels uh, as well. Okay, thanks a lot for letting us know about um, this um, yes, development on the Canadian side uh, of the story. Um, and so far, we we finished um, the topic online selling of goods and services. And again, if there is a question, just um, type in and let us know so that we can um, give you maybe a bit more specific detail on your uh, on your interests. Otherwise, we will uh, skip over to um, the next topic, which is supply chain issues. And it's again you, Stacy, who would like to give us some insight on that. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so. Um, you know, obviously we've got our marketplace facilitators and Amazon being a huge player in that. And from a U.S. perspective, um, you know, I talked about Wayfair and how the game is changing with respect to Nexus and the uh, passage of economic Nexus thresholds. However, I did note that physical presence is still a Nexus trigger. And for anybody who is selling on Amazon through, you know, as a fulfilled by Amazon seller, which is a, you know, which is a great way, particularly if you're inbound and, um, you know, trying to get an entree into the U.S., um, completely understand how uh, that's a great strategy to go through Amazon and Amazon kind of speaks for itself. Uh, but the problem being that Amazon has warehouses all over the US and if anybody's looked at a map of where those warehouses are over the past few years, they have uh, just added more and more warehouses. And what this means is that items that are gonna be sold on Amazon that are you know, for an FBA seller, they might be shipped to a specific location at, at the start, however, Amazon then has control of that inventory and will move it around unbeknownst, honestly, to a lot of the FBA sellers. And so having that inventory in a jurisdiction is physical presence. And so the Wayfair thresholds don't even matter at that point. You, you know, taxpayers then have inventory, physical presence, and therefore nexus in a jurisdiction in which uh, they have that, in which that inventory sits. And what's, 
what some of our clients struggle with, honestly, is the fact that because they don't know that Amazon's moving that around, um, and I think more recently Amazon has gotten better about, at least here for our U.S. FBA sellers, they've gotten better about providing uh, information to them on where that inventory has been or and or may be going. Um, some of our clients are able to respond. However, what we've also been seeing is some states subpoenaing records from Amazon so that they know and they've been contacting uh, certain taxpayers because of that, getting that information about inventory in their states. Uh, California has done this recently, actually. Uh, so we've seen a lot of our clients get notices, and if, if they're an FBA seller, that California will send them a notice saying, we have information that uh, inventory has been in our state, therefore you need to register. And so this can create a, a little bit of a Pandora's box for them because perhaps that inventory has been sitting there for, uh, or in and out of California for a few years. And that means that they have some past exposure. And so back to our prior conversation about, okay, well, what do taxpayers do if uh, they haven't been collecting? Well, uh, that's also an issue in this situation because California would have already, in this case, in this example, California would have already contacted them. So it's it puts our tax our clients and our taxpayers in a little bit of a, it pushes them back into a little bit of a corner where they have to, uh, do a little bit of digging to see kind of what exposure might they have in that situation. So we've been recommending our FBA sellers to get a little bit more proactive about it and understand where, if they can, where that inventory, where their inventory has been so that they, they can respond. Now, we've got a lot of states um, more and more going in this direction, which is uh, a good thing. Uh, but we've got a lot of states that have passed marketplace facilitator rules similar to some of the other countries that we've talked about earlier. Uh, and what that means is that uh, the marketplace facilitators like an Amazon would collect and remit on the uh, FBA seller's behalf, which is great. And so that, you know, kind of alleviates some of that stress and uh, potential exposure for our, our FBA sellers. However, we've only got a handful of states that have these rules and we've, we're seeing more and more legislation uh, being proposed. Uh, this time of year, our uh, state legislatures are in session for the most part. And uh, we've seen a lot of bills proposed in a lot of the states for marketplace facilitator uh, rules. So we'll see probably a few more states come on board, but it's, it's slow. And so we have this period where we need to deal with the states that don't have those rules. And then we also need to be cognizant of the fact that we've got taxpayers, online sellers that are selling on Amazon, but they also sell on their own website. So if they are not registered in a state in which Amazon is collecting and remitting, uh, they need to do that because Amazon or because Amazon's collecting and uh, remitting on their behalf, that state's already uh, aware that they're operating there. So we just are recommending our clients get registered in the states that uh, have the marketplace facilitator rules if they are also selling on Amazon. So. Thanks, thanks a lot, Stacey. That's very interesting to hear that also um, in the US, the same problems exist like we have here in the EU with the FBA program of Amazon because Amazon is deciding where the goods get stored. And that is a big challenge also, challenge also for the FBA sellers here in the EU. Alexander, maybe you can give us a short insight in this respect. Um, yeah, um, supply chain issues um, in the EU are not only uh, of interest in the area of marketplaces, Amazon and so on, but also just for standard offline businesses, uh, because we here in the EU has um, um, a large history of um, court decisions and different vet handlings in the different EU jurisdictions uh, on that in, um, kind of uh, supplies. But first of all, what is the supply chain from a VT perspective in the EU? Um, that's something um, that um, takes place um, um, supply between at least three different uh, parties um, about the same good and uh, the goods are transported from the first party to the last part of the supply chain uh, so that the um, interim and middle um, uh, party is not involved um, and will not see uh, the goods actually uh, and uh, especially on cross-border transaction there's a huge impact because the question is which of the different supplies between the first and the second um, um, party of the supply chain or between the second and the third party of the supply chain 
can be handled um, zero rated uh, as an intercommunity supply of goods or as an export. Um, and um, since each EU country has uh, different um, ideas um, how that should work, um, uh, all of the companies in the EU has a problem um, how to react um, and has risk uh, on tax audits, uh, whether the tax auditor will raise some VET because um, not all requirements are met um, for handling a transaction as zero rated um, in case of a supply chain. But um, the EU um, government um, has realized that um, this is a problem that needs to be solved on the uh, EU per way um, for all uh, countries um, in a similar way. Uh, and now um, uh, some new aspects are published from the EU that should be implemented um, from 1st of um, January 2020. Uh, and um, the different EU countries now are starting to implement and to amend uh, the VET Act um, so that it be um, able to be realized um, from 2020. Uh, what is the major um, impact? Um, um, in case um, that the intermediary party of the supply chain is responsible for the transport, and um, if this party is using a VET registration number of the country, um, uh, different from the country where the transport starts, uh, then um, uh, it is simplified uh, that um, the first delivery between the first and the second party can be handled as um, a zero-rated um, intercommunity supply, um, uh, so that um, always in these cases um, the first supply can be handled um, without VT, and no VT needs to be issued on the invoice, um, and um, the intermediary party can avoid any VAT registration at the start of the origin of the goods. Um, furthermore, um, the delivery uh, between um, the intermediary and the customer will be uh, then taxable in the country where the goods are actually received um, by the customer. Um, so uh, that the intermediary still needs the VAT registration probably in the country um, of destination. Um, but that depends on the specific law of each um, EU country. So in all cases um, where the intermediary party of the supply chain is involved uh, with the transport, then now we have here um, a simplification regulation um, and uh, the intermediary party and the first party in the supply chain knows that the first uh, sale can be handled without VET. In all other cases, that means um, if um, the first party of the supply chain or the last party of the supply chain is responsible for the transport, we still have um, the situation uh, that um, uh, the VET law is not um, still the same in each EU country and um, each um, company needs to check um, on a country-based side um, whether um, uh, the VET handling is the same um, in each EU country or whether uh, they are maybe not able to handle it um, zero-rated. In case of uh, transports to non-EU countries, that means exports, um, um, the EU has not uh, yet decided about um, a wet law um, amendment, but um, Germany is uh, going to um, use the same regulations um, for non-EU countries as for uh, transports within the EU, uh, but it's not clear whether the other EU countries will follow uh, that way um, Germany is doing. So um, supply chains here in the EU, and especially in Germany, are still very complex, um, uh, and um, this year, this amendment from 2020 is a small step um, to um, avoid um, VAT registrations um, and VAT payment um, issues um, in, in some cases um, if the intermediary party um, is responsible for the transport. Thank you very much, Alexander. I think that is um, uh, pretty interesting for a couple of clients or potential clients. But if you need some detailed input on this, um, of course, Alexander is willing to answer your question also um, after the webinar. Just contact the hlbi.global um, uh, homepage and then any question will be passed on. Um, Robert, maybe you can give us an insight on what is taking place um, in the UK for construction services. There is, 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 a, is a change forthcoming. Yes, so this is a change to uh, domestic supply chain, um, which will have a big impact on the construction industry due to come in on the 1st of October this year. Um, and it's designed as an anti-fraud measure to combat missing trader fraud, where a supplier will charge VAT collect the VAT from its customer and then disappear without paying the VAT over. Um, HMRC uh, estimate that around 100 million each year is lost in this way in the construction industry. 
So this is relevant to construction services, which is the construction, alteration, repair, or extension of buildings, um, things like painting, decorating, um, and maybe the installation of heating, lighting, and air conditioning systems. So there's certain services in construction which qualify. Um, what it's aimed to do is, it's where a subcontractor makes a supply to a main contractor, who will then in turn make an onward supply of construction services to an end user. So the subcontractor will not charge VAT to the main contractor, but instead will indicate it's a reverse charge under the construction services. The main contractor will um, self-account the VAT under the domestic reverse charge, um, and that will affect be a, a nil net on its VAT return, so the effect should be neutral. Um, but then the main contractor in making the onward supply of construction services to the end user, such as a property developer, they will use the normal VAT rules, so we'll charge VAT as applicable. So this is for the subcontractor charging a main contractor who is making an onward supply of construction services. So there's a few accounting issues which need to be brought into, into effect here. The reverse charge on the return, the domestic reverse charge statement on the invoice, the indicated to a domestic reverse charge, um, and obviously the subcontractor and main contractor need to know um, how to deal with it on, on their VAT returns and in their reporting. So it's quite a change for the construction sector uh, and it, they need to be aware of this coming in in the 1st of October this year. Okay, thank you. Um, in Germany, we also know this concept um, of a reverse charge on contracts and insurance services, and um, we sometimes have quite a big s struggle in order to define what a construction service is. Do you expect something similar discussions on the UK side? Yeah, there is guidance on this already in the construction industry. So HMRC have set out a list of what is construction services and what isn't. But I guess where you get into the technicalities on, on some services, there could be a debate, and I suppose we look to case law ultimately. Uh, but HMRC have got guidance on this and on what qualifies and what doesn't. Okay, thanks um, very much, um, because that's very important to have a, a mutual understanding um, with the taxpayer and also the tax authorities. It helps a lot. Um, Sean, maybe you can also then continue in order to um, tell us about think, uh, about making tax digital. That's a new concept in terms of uh, VAT compliance in uh, the UK, I guess. Yes, so this is quite a big thing uh, coming in 1st of April, so uh, Monday I think that is. Um, it's been on the cards for a while now um, and it's, a, a, as you say, a major initiative to digitise the, uh, the UK tax system and it's, it's aimed at taxpayer behaviour um, and trying to in eliminate manual processes and taxpayer error. HMRC has come up with a figure of something like 36 billion um, they estimate uh, is, at, is at stake due to taxpayer error. I mean that's quite a large number and we're not entirely sure where they've got that from. But uh, making tax digital is also um, supposed to generate an extra 1 billion in VAT uh, come 2022-23. Um, it's also, I think, part of uh, what we said earlier on the online selling compliance part um, that HMRC are using more and more technology, data mining tools to um, within their systems as well. So I think eventually we're going to get to a point where HMRC can effectively plug into your numbers remotely and, and do a VAT audit that way. So the new rule, as I say, comes into effect on the 1st of April this year. And it's compulsory if you trade over the current VAT registration threshold of £85,000. Supplies above that threshold, you are in making tax digital. If you're below that, you can still go into it voluntarily, but you have to bear in mind once you're in, you cannot opt out. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an in, and once you're in, you're there. There's a delayed start of implementation for, of the 1st of October this year if you're an overseas business, so not established in the UK or if you're a VAT group, so there's slightly delayed implementation for that. And what, what this means is that you need to now keep digital VAT records. So all of your books and records must be held digitally, and there must be a digital link between your accounting software and HMRC's online submission for the nine boxes of the UK VAT return. Um, this is done by using what they call functional compatible software, of which there's an HMRC approved list and it's relevant to your sales purchases and your VAT account. So if you're in Making Tax Digital, the current HMRC online portal will be closed to you, and you'll have to do this by your, your submission under Making Tax Digital using the relevant software. Currently, interest at an EC sales is not affected, and there's due to be a, as they call it, a soft landing approach 
for the next year up until April 2020, although that's not an excuse for non-compliance, and there'll be penalties for failure to keep digital records, and default surcharges for late submission and late payments still apply. There is also apparently going to be a, a new points-based penalty system from April next year, but as yet we don't have full details of that. So this is quite a big change, and I think we're going to see perhaps a lot of potential problems once, you, once this goes live, uh, with most people who are on a quarterly return having their first return due for submission on the 7th of August, uh, once it's in on the 1st of April. So I think a big thing for us and our clients, and we're trying to help a lot of people at the moment. Thanks, Sean. So, so it's, a, it's a total different world than uh, compared to the past, um, and that, uh, of course, must be a big challenge to the advisors as well as the taxpayers. Um, Lloyd, maybe you can give us an insight about uh, compliance issues on imports, because um, there seems to be some struggle around that. Yes, uh, because of the uncertainty, uh, supply chain issues, uh, Brexit, uh, we, had, we just uh, went through a Canada, US, Mexico free trade negotiations, and we're currently embroiled with the Americans in the, uh, these countervailing duties on, uh, on, on certain metals and, and dairy products and everything like that. What we're seeing is a trend now where the, uh, the companies are un uncertain as to what their costs are going to be, and uh, they're asking their suppliers to bring the goods into Canada as the import of record. So we're, we're seeing a lot of foreign companies that previously would export the goods into the FOB, their door, uh, wherever in Europe or the United States. But the Canadian uh, purchaser is saying, well, you know what, with all this uncertainty, you bring the goods in, you're going you're gonna to do the, uh, uh, the importation, pay for the duties, and, and bear all these additional costs. And this is uh, effectively requiring some of these importers to carry on business in Canada uh, to, and cover the cost of these additional levies if they want to do business with Canadian customers. And of course, this, this brings a huge compliance burden on these foreign companies that are not uh, really familiar with, with the system. And it, require, it requires adjustments to sale pricing and um, uh, you know the rules of how do they become an importer of record, dealing with the customs brokers and stuff like that. And, um, you know, in terms of if you're going to register a non-resident, you're going to have to put some protection into the system. So there's bonds that have to be posted by these non-resident companies who are now operating in Canada sort of in, in a quasi manner bringing in these goods. And they're going to have – they post bonds, monetary bonds, equal to a percentage of what their, their actual uh, tax liabilities could be. And of course, this, this also results in a somewhat of an accounting nightmare for companies that are kind of uh, not really uh, corporations in Canada, but are, uh, you know, uh, operating as a uh, perhaps a U.S. company with not not a branch really in Canada, but an operation in Canada. Now you have to have records in, in Canadian dollars, uh, keeping track of your Canadian sales, uh, and merging that with your with your foreign records means foreign exchange uh, issues and everything like that. And of course, the contract issue is another thing where people went into long -term, longer term contracts and now are going to shorter term contracts because they can't take the chance with all this uh, disruption in the supply chain. And again, it could be Brexit, it could be Canada free trade, or it could be countervailing duties. They are protecting themselves. And uh, this is this has really made life very difficult and, and forced a lot of companies to effectively operate in Canada where they would have chosen not to. The compliance burden, of course, is is where, where this all falls on the, uh, the non-resident and that's something that we can help with. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's all, it's all things that are doable, but it's, it's, it does make uh, life a lot more complex. When you're when you're forced into operating in a foreign jurisdiction, but we are seeing more and more of this. Yes, yeah, thanks. To be compliant in foreign jurisdiction is always a challenge. I think Stacy, you can uh, also um, uh, support this uh, opinion because also the U.S. has uh, a lot of compliance requirements. Um, yes, indeed. Uh, we have, you know, 50 different states that all kind of operate as their own country, if you want to think about it that way. 
Um, and our system, our you know, sales and youth tax system is just a little bit more complicated and cumbersome, quite frankly. Uh, so now we've got a situation where it's gotten more cumbersome just because of Wayfair and um, it was already bad enough, I think, to begin with. But with the uh, passage of Wayfair and the states reacting, now we've got clients, taxpayers that are trying to grapple with, okay, I'm happy to go and register and start collecting where I need to uh, and get compliant, uh, but uh, how do I do that? And uh, what do I need to do to do that? Um, and from a, from a sourcing standpoint for uh, sales and use tax, uh, taxpayers need to uh, be sourcing their sales uh, to a jurisdiction and charging the rate based on ship to. And that sometimes uh, the rate associated with that can be lots of different combinations. Um, you can have a state rate, a city rate, a county rate, and maybe even a special district district rate that could be applicable um, all for one shipment to a customer in a jurisdiction or in a location. Uh, so how do taxpayers determine what those rates are? Uh, we've been highly recommending automation, honestly, uh, just because it's very difficult to keep for clients to keep track of the rates and the rates change. Uh, so we've been recommending automation, but obviously automation comes with a price. And so we've got lots of remote sellers, online sellers that, you know, may not have been able to um, react or are still trying to react to Wayfair. They didn't know that it was going to pass. We didn't either. And so they're, they may not have budgeted for automation. Uh, there's lots of software vendors out there that do track rates and they also will do the compliance piece of it. They will uh, connect to their you know, ERP systems or point of sale systems and uh, be able to do the compliance. But from a pure rate perspective, we are just recommending um, uh, automation uh, as much as possible. And um, just you know, a quick note on actual compliance, the, the frequency of returns. Uh, our states are all over the place with respect to frequency, meaning do our taxpayers need to file monthly, quarterly, annually? Um, and so keeping track of that also is very difficult. And that's another reason why automation is, uh, is key and can be very helpful for taxpayers. But like I said, it comes with the price. Do you, do you see any chance of harmonization in terms of all these different tax rates and uh, of those all these uh, different states or do you think that's uh, that's uh, only a wishing wishing situation <laughs> right you know i i don't see it happening in my lifetime uh okay. you know we have we have we have um we have what's called the streamlined sales tax uh, project and some taxpayers out there may be aware of that where there's about 26 states that are part of this project. Uh, I think when that was passed several years ago, there were high hopes that it would, you know, go gangbusters and things would be um, all standardized. We'd have one rate, uh, things like that. And as many of you who may be aware of the Streamline Sales Tax Project, it's been slow to get going. And as you can imagine, we've got a lot of states, there's 26 that are part of it. Obviously not everybody that's in the US that has a sales tax. Uh, so even in those 26, they have their own kind of self interests at heart first. So we're seeing some standardization of definitions, uh, but it is a long way off before we may see any kind of harmonization. Um, and like I said, I don't envision that in my lifetime, <laughs> unfortunately. Okay, but uh, at the end of the day, um, all the clients or prospective clients know who they can ask, which um, is you and the colleagues who also take part in this webinar. We are at the end of this webinar. Um, as far as I'm aware, no questions have been asked for now, but um, if uh, somebody of you could, um, of course, contact us via the HLBI website, just click on the comment or the contact formula and send us an email and then we will of course be happy to come back to you in terms of any question you may have and in terms of uh, your business please don't hesitate to contact hlb and the hlb member firms in order to help you out in terms of indirect taxes 
as you can learn from this webinar, there's a lot of development going on and it's very hard to stay tuned and to comply with all the rules by your own. So just use the help we can offer and we will be happy to do so. Thanks to all the speakers. Um, time is up. Um, I wish you all a good day um, as far as, as you have it in front of us here in Germany. We have already almost closed. So um, thanks a lot and looking forward to speaking to you again sometime. Bye bye.